Welcome to Meat Cutting Day 3 Lecture. Today we're going to talk about the composition of meat. You guys learned in your reading on day 1 that water is pri that protein, meat, is primarily made up of water, approximately 75%. It's almost always consistent in chicken, pork, veal. If it's meaty, it's got about 75% water. Protein, you learned, was about 20% and fat was about 5%. What we're not, what we didn't take into that scenario on day one from the reading is that minerals make up about the remaining 4%, considering that it's 3 to 5 or 18 to 20%. The most important thing to remember is that the majority of meat is water, right? Why is that important to think about? Because what happens when we take a pot of water, we put it on a burner, we turn it on high, what happens to that water? It evaporates. No matter how hard we try, we cannot make a vegetarian water-based demi. It just doesn't happen. All the water evaporates out. The same thing is true when we apply heat to meat. Once we apply heat to that protein strand, we actually evaporate the moisture out of the protein strand. The doneness of meat is determined by the application of heat and the reduction of moisture within the actual protein strand. It's important to understand the moisture content to more accurately, accurately manipulate the meat to your advantage. Understanding how the meat is going to change through cooking and also how the meat is going to change through preservation or the application of salts that are going to remove or displace moisture. Proteins are broken down by, di by digestive enzymes into amino acids, um, at which point they become readily absorbed into the bloodstream. And that's why this is very essential to understanding how protein is very good for us when we eat it. They become the building blocks of all living things. Another group of substances related to proteins are purines, pyrimidines, and nucleopeptides, just fun to say. Um, they have very little nutritional value, but what they do do, what they do do, however, is they, na they have the natural ability to excite our gastric juices. That's why when you're walking down the street and you smell meat grilling and you have this innate sense to just start walking towards that grilled meat, wherever it might be, even vegetarians have this sense of Oh my goodness, I smell meat cooking, I must go to meat. It's because as we cook the meat and we release the moisture, the moisture contains these pyrimidines, nucleopeptides, and pyr uh, purines. Um, combined with fats, they're primarily responsible for carrying the flavor and the overall aroma of meat. So when you smell that meat cooking, it's because we've applied heat, the moisture is evaporating out, and that's what we smell. It's found more abundantly or, or more developed in older animals. That's why if you took a, a piece of meat from a cow that was 16 years old versus one that's six months old and you put them down, that cow would smell, that's older, would smell incredibly gamey. Uh, it has a much more concentrated flavor and the muscles tend to be much tougher because the protein strand has worked much more and much longer. It gives the meat a characteristically gamey flavor and that gamey flavor is directly related to iron content. Now you're thinking, he's explained this to me, now so what the hell does he mean? Imagine you're washing a cast iron skillet, not with soap, because then you would ruin the seasoning and it's totally screwed, but imagine for somehow you decided to lick the bottom of the cast iron skillet. All right, now you're grossed out, but you're with me, because you can kind of get that in your olfactory sensor, or where all smells and sensors are processed. You can smell and feel at the same time that, that flavor of what iron is and what gamey means. Muscle breakdown. The smallest form of the muscle is known as the myofibril. Uh, it's a hair-like strand which is surrounded by collagen. Collagen is going to be the most consistent thing that we see throughout this explanation of how the muscle is broken down. Collagen is omnipresent. It's everywhere. Okay? Next we have a fiber, which is basically a bundle of myofibrils held together by a sheath of collagen. Finally we have the muscle a bundle of fibers held together or in place by reticulin. When we look at muscles, the myofibril is actually can only be detected by an electron microscope. It's so, so very small that you can't see it. When we distinguish how we're going to cut the meat, if we're cutting it with the grain or across the grain, it's primarily decided by the direction in which the fiber is moving. So when we look at that, we are actually cutting the fiber into pieces. So take your hand and put it across to you. If you look at your fingers and they're pointing to your, using your left hand, you're pointing to the right, you can see that your fingers running across. Now imagine those are rubber bands or the fibers of the muscle, if you will. If you cut those across, you're gonna see it's much easier to ingest because now you're dealing with smaller pieces in your mouth. If you cut it lengthwise, well obviously you wouldn't do that because I know you're all incredible meat cutters. 
um, this is a very cool picture of, of what's happening. So what we've done is we've, we've taken the, the, the biceps femoris of, off of the femur and we're doing a cross section and looking at how that's broken down. So here we can see the muscle and then we see the fiber and then we see the myofibril, the tiny little hair-like strand within that. The coolest thing to me about this is, has anyone ever gone across the bridge, uh, like the Brooklyn Bridge, and you see the, the cables that hold that in place? Those cables were actually designed after the human body. So if you look at that cable, it's a bundle of small cables held together by larger bundles that actually form the bundle that holds that in place. This talks about how the muscle works and, and how it, where it's working. It's actually talking about actin and myosin. Actin and myosin slide together. When a muscle is relaxed, we see that there is no pressure in between, and there's the space. It's kind of like the teeth on a comb. When the muscle is engaged, the actin and myosin slide together, creating the firmness or the rigidity or the active muscle, which is engaged. There's different types of muscles. First types that we're talking about, and the kind that we're most familiar with, is skeletal muscles. That's what we've been fabricating in the lab so far. They're responsible for the movement. They're attached to the bones. They're responsible for something we like to call locomotion. Um, next, we have smooth muscles. Think about smooth muscles. Don't go the wrong way. Smooth muscles are brains, lungs, intestines, sweetbreads, and organ muscles. Now, we also read about variety meats. So smooth muscles primarily are made up of uh, variety meats. And then lastly, we have the cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is by far the most amazing muscle in any living animal. Um, the heart muscle has its own system of electrical stimulant. It actually has two that are on there. We've all heard about the defibrillation. and We've seen it on some sort of emergency show where they're jamming this thing on the heart and they're, they're causing it to, to uh, pounce and causing it to move. And what's actually happening in that scenario is they're actually stopping the heart because when the heart goes into ventricular fibrillation, all four chambers are firing at once. And what a defibrillator does is it stops the heart. It's kind of like if you're in a situation where someone's freaking out and you see someone smack them, and they're like, oh, okay, I'm good. It's, it's kind of like basically that's what you're doing to your heart. And here we see a different picture of those muscles. So here we have a, a great picture of skeletal muscles and all the muscles that we've been talking about in class while we're stretching. Uh, we see the brain, which is a smooth muscle. We see the kidneys, which are also a smooth muscle. Um, we see some organ meat or some liver here. And then, you know, just wanted to give you a nice picture of the heart. So there's a, a living heart that's inside someone's chest cavity. Fat is not flavor. It is the carrier of flavor. Despite what you've been told, despite any of those fancy shows that you've seen, fat is not flavor. If we did a vertical tasting of fat, say that we took uh, three different kinds of animals, we rendered the fat, we then did a tasting, it would taste, oddly enough, like mm, fat. So let's say, for against that, that we took that, we had those three vats of fat, that we then put one garlic, and then in the other we put rosemary, and another one we put black peppercorns, and we brought that up to about 90 degrees, and we let those flavors infuse into the fat. And then what you would taste is the dramatic representation of those particular flavors that we put into the fat. The reason behind what's happening here is when we look at a fat cell, a fat cell is basically a little hollow bubble, and that hollow bubble is very uh, absorbent of flavor, and it's going to carry the flavor. Where it becomes important to us is in how the fat is distributed within the interior of the muscle. There are three types of fat that we're going to discuss. The first one is subcutaneous. Uh, it's found on the exterior of the muscle. Subcutaneous means just underneath the skin. The second kind is called intermuscular, and it's found on the interior of the muscles, and this is the one that we're primarily concerned with. It's called marbling. It's what's going to distinguish the overall quality and therefore give it a grade. Good marbling will look like evenly drawn white lines. Uh, it's going to look like someone took a, a pencil, like a white colored pencil, and has just drawn little bitty white lines in between that. If you look at Kobe beef, it's the best example of incredible marbling. If you were massaged and sake and sang to and, and treated like a royalty, you would develop amazing marbling as well. We're not going to eat you, but just thinking about that. The grading of meat is based on how evenly distributed that fat is in the interior of the meat. The more evenly distributed the fat is, the more moist the meat will be, and the more texturally advantageous that meat will be as well. What's happening is we talked about the myofibril being the smallest form of the muscle. 
we talked about how fat, we want it to be equally distributed on the interior of the muscle. Once that fat is evenly distributed, we want to see how it's going to act when we apply heat to that. What we know about animal fat is that it's saturated fat. We know this because it's solid at room temperature. Once that fat is solid at room temperature, that's where it's going to become a solid thing. When we render the fat in the lab, you can see that it's liquid when it's hot after we've separated out the solids, the cracklings, and the crispy bits. And then we put it in the fridge, we come back the next day, and it's hard as a brick. That's a good example of saturated fat. <coughs> as heat is applied to the meat, the fat is liquefied, and we saw that through the rendering process. We took it from a solid state, we took it to a liquid state. What's happening is that fat, the more evenly distributed it is throughout the interior of the muscle, the better lubricant it will become. It all boils down to lubrication, the secret of life. So the more evenly distributed that fat is on the interior of the muscle, once the heat is applied, it's going to become a lubricant to the myofibril. And that's why it's important to understand the smallest form of the muscle up to the muscle itself. So once that fat is, is heated up, it becomes liquid, it lubricates the myofibril, and that's what makes it delicious. Bad marbling will look like a large pocket of fat, unevenly distributed, and usually appears in one section of the muscle. So when we look at this prime, you can see those beautiful striations of fat. It has a decent amount of fat on the outside, but you're going to see primarily a good even distribution of fat on s in the inside. So imagine that we haven't talked about grading at all. The one that you want is this one. This is the money shot, right? Over here, as we go from prime to choice to select, you're going to see excuse me, that that fat becomes less evenly distributed and the quality becomes less advantageous. Another kind of fat is KHP fat. And KHP fat is actually called kidney, heart, and pelvic fat. Kidney, heart, and pelvic fat is found, as you might imagine, in the kidney, heart, and pelvic area. What this is, when we looked at chickens, we talked about removal of the abdominal cavity fat. And this is essentially what this fat is. It's the fat that surrounds the organs and protects them from slamming into your bones. Uh, it also determines the quality of life once led by the animal. The reason that this becomes something that we look at to determine the quality of life that the animal led, let's take, take for instance, uh, a car crash. Let's say that we're in a car crash. When you're in a car crash, there's multiple points of impact. The first point of impact, obviously, is car slamming against object. Okay, so obviously, car hits object. The next thing that happens is your body hits the car. Okay, second point of impact. The third point of impact, and the most deadly, most detrimental, is the point of impact at which your internal organs slam against the, the, the bones in your body. Um, so th that's the primary reason that that's there. Now you're wondering, he's told me this, what the hell does he have to do with the quality of life that the animal led? Generally, when you get whole carcass animals, because you're all going to be working with local farmers to get the best meat that you can, you want to ask for something called the gut bag. It's just fun to ask for. In that bag, you want to extract the heart. The heart is delicious. You're going to prepare it in meaningful and delicious ways. But what you want to look at primarily is how the fat is distributed on the exterior of that heart. If you find a very thick, concentrated amount of fat, that's going to be indicative of an animal that was primarily grain-fed. Uh, very little grass feeding has gone into that animal, therefore the meat is going to be less nutritious and not as delicious. When you see a heart that has very little fat and sometimes no fat at all, that's a sign of an animal which has been malnourished. That meat is going to be tough and mealy and also lack a nutritional value. What you want to see is a very thin coating of evenly distributed fat that surrounds the heart and is uniform in distribution. Also know that fat provides energy for muscles. So when we see it on the exterior of a chunk of muscles, we have to understand what that fat is doing. That fat is giving energy to the muscle at a specific location. And that ends our fatty discussion. Have a great night. Bye-bye.